Genesis 47 is where we find ourselves. I want to speak with you this morning about uncommon wisdom. You know what common sense is, of course. It's common. Everybody should have it, or they should. It's sense is something instinctive, intuitive, innate, something natural, something you just understand. There's an old cowboy song. I think it's called something like Cowboy Common Sense, and the chorus goes, always drink upstream from the herd. (laughs) Don't look straight up at a bird. (laughs) When you get bucked off, get back on, and son, don't squat with your spurs on. (laughs) So... (laughs) That's well, common sense. Uh, uh, philosophers called it a priori knowledge. What does that mean? It, it means something that you, you, you can figure out even without experience, just by using logic. Socrates uh, famously taught by asking questions. He thought that people really knew everything there is to know. It was within them, and a teacher's job was to draw that out by, by asking questions. He thought, he thought, I could take a a kid who's never been to school and I could get him, by asking a series of questions, I could get him to articulate the Pythagorean theorem. And uh, he was convinced that that was possible. That's, That's common sense, using our minds. Uncommon wisdom is something a little bit different. It's uncommon. Few people have it. And it's wisdom. It's something that you you have to learn, mostly because it kind of counterintuitive. Let me give you an example of uncommon wisdom. Jesus said, whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Wisdom, but very uncommon and something that you have to be taught. You wouldn't naturally think that the way to save your life would be to lose it for Jesus' sake. In Genesis 47, here in the story of Joseph, I want to just point out to you four dimensions, I guess you could say, of, of uncommon wisdom in this story. I'm actually going to begin back in verse 31 of chapter 46. Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I'll go up and tell Pharaoh and say to him, my brothers and my father's household who are in the land of Canaan have come to me and the men are shepherds for they've been keepers of livestock and they've brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. When Pharaoh calls you and says, what is your occupation? You shall say, your servants have been keepers of livestock from our youth even until now, both we and our fathers, in order that you may dwell in the land of Goshen for every shepherd is... An abomination to the Egyptians. Now, let me just pause our reading here for a minute and tell you I was excited to come to this passage because I've been curious about it. There are many things about the Bible that I don't know, and this was one of them. And I thought to myself, what on earth is going on here? Because Joseph says, um, I'm going to go tell Pharaoh and say that you're shepherds. Okay. And, and when you go to Pharaoh, say, uh, Pharaoh's going to say, what's, what's your job? What do you do? And, and, and you're supposed to say, we're keepers of livestock. And the reason you should say that is because the Egyptians hate the shepherds. And so what I th- always thought was going on was just tell Pharaoh you're not shepherds, keepers of sheep. Just kind of tell him you're in general tenders of animals, and then he won't hate you so bad. That's kind of how I read that. He kind of make a distinction between, between keepers of livestock and, and shepherds. But, but then you get into 47, and, and watch what happens. Um, Joseph went in and told Pharaoh, my father and my brothers with their flocks and herds and all that they possess have come from the land of Canaan. They're now in the land of Goshen. And from among his brothers, he took five men, presented them to Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to his brothers, what is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, your servants are shepherds, as our fathers were. And I'm like, he just told you not to say that. That's kind of how I had always understood that. Because the Egyptians hate Hate the shepherds. Well, it turns out shepherds and keepers of livestock are just interchangeable terms. And Joseph was actually telling his brothers to just say that you're shepherds. And the Egyptians hate shepherds. And so 
see what happens kind of, kind of a thing. So they said to Pharaoh, verse 4, We've come to sojourn in the land, for there's no pasture for your servants' flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And let me just stop right there. The first dimension of uncommon wisdom in this portion of Scripture is the, the uncommon wisdom of separation. Separation. Why, why would you tell the Egyptians that you're shepherds if the Egyptians hate shepherds? That's weird. It's like, if, what do you think is going to happen? Well, here's what's going to happen. They're going to say, you, you guys just go over there. You go over there and, and be by yourself. Now, I was thinking about this just in terms of cost-benefit, you know, saying you're shepherds. So the cost is you're unwelcome in society. If, if you're shepherds, the Egyptians hated the shepherds. Uh, the shepherds were lower-class uh, citizens in Egypt, so they're going to be permanent members of the lower class. They're going to be viewed with suspicion. So why on earth say that you're shepherds? The cost seems to be really high. Now, it's the truth on the one hand, so there's that. But, but Joseph presents this as a strategy. So, so what's the benefits of, of doing this? Well, they're, they're going to be separated from the general population of Egypt. And what that's going to do is help preserve the family and preserve the line. Do you remember back in chapter 34, um, Shechem, uh, he fell in love with Jacob's daughter. And in a terrible expression of his love, he, he raped her. Um, but but he, he wanted to marry her. And, and so he and Jacob's sons worked out this kind of deal where, where they would intermarry. And, and they would become one people. And we, we know that God didn't want that to happen. Uh, that God wants his people to maintain their their identity, their identity as the offspring of Abraham. This is a little family. Even at this point, it's about 70, 70 people. And that their family identity can get lost if they end up getting absorbed into the Egyptian culture. And so part of the wisdom of saying we're shepherds is being quarantined. Just like, you guys go over there and just kind of be by yourselves. And that's actually a good thing. That's going to preserve the family identity. It's going to preserve the line from which the Lord Jesus is going to come. But also, there's a religious element to this. The word abomination strikes you as kind of a religious sort of word, doesn't it? And, and, and the, the, their separation from the Egyptian religious society is going to help preserve their loyalty to God. So, th- so you think about that word abomination. It means hatred, but it kind of has a connotation of disgust, doesn't it? Disgust, repulsion, revulsion. Some things are disgusting on a physical level. Uh, slugs and snakes and spiders. I saw a big spider down in Peru. It was about the size of my hand and it was in the water there and I had to pass by because I was in a river and the river was really muddy and I couldn't see very far in the water so that was creepy enough and then there's this big spider there and uh, the guy who worked at the park said oh he won't kill you you'll just be paralyzed for a couple hours and so okay well not worried about the big spider now yeah great. So some things are kind of disgusting to us that way. Some things are disgusting on an emotional level. You know, the thought of being betrayed, angry outbursts are kind of disgusting. Um, there's, there's cruelty, cruel words. There's a revulsion that we have to that. And some things are, are an abomination. They're disgusting on a religious level, aren't they? For the Jews, it's eating pork. Or for the Muslims, for the Mormons, it's drinking caffeine for for us as as christians we should have a kind of level of disgust when people use the lord's name in vain oh my god you should be disgusted when you hear that when people use the name of christ in vain you 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 feel a disgust maybe when you see people tearing pages out of a bible and stomping on them kind of desecrating our symbols there was that infamous work of art several years ago work of art a guy peed in a jar and dropped a crucifix in it and said that's art 
And, and, and that, that creates a kind of revulsion in us. It's a, on a religious level. If you read the old English Puritans, they were deeply, deeply offended by people doing ordinary things on the Lord's Day. Said, this is the Lord's Day. You've got six other days to do your stuff. This day belongs to the Lord. You do God's stuff on the Lord's Day. There was a re- revulsion to doing common things on the Lord's Day. For the Egyptians, it seems like there was something ab- abominable, something religiously repulsive about those who made their living tending livestock. And so, so the old commentator Barnes said, the two nations, Israel and Egypt, were in some important respects mutually repulsive. The idolatrous and superstitious customs of the Egyptians were abhorrent to a worshiper of the true God. And every shepherd was the abomination of Egypt. And and, and so I think he's right. This uh, confession, we are shepherds, creates a separation between Jacob's family and, and the Egyptians. And that's a good thing. Because with that separation, it's, it becomes impossible for Jacob's family and future generations to, to involve themselves in the religious life of the Egyptians. They're just not welcome there. And that's actually not such a bad thing. There's an, there's an uncommon wisdom that says we, we need to be separated from those influences that can lead us away from God. Isn't Solomon such a great example of this? He, 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 it's almost I don't know, kind of romantic when it talks about how much Solomon loved his wives. So it's kind of romantic because he loved them, right? But it's wives, so this sort of loses its charm. But it says he loved them. And they drew his heart away from God. They drew his heart away from God. Wisdom would have said, stay away. Stay away. Stay away from these women. It would have been so much better, not only for him, but for the entire nation. And so Joseph shows us the the uncommon wisdom of being separate. Now even today, God's people have a really complicated relationship with the world. And by the, by, by the phrase the world, I mean those people who are not God's people and, and the culture that they create. That's kind of how the Bible uses that term. So, you know, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So, so there the world, that phrase, means people that needed Jesus to die for them, right? God gave his, his son for them. It's people God loves, but who need to be rescued out of the world. There's a similar but slightly different shade of meaning in John 15, where Jesus says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So, so, so you notice what Jesus says. The world is, is that, what, that which hates Jesus, that which is opposed to, to Jesus. The world is what hates the people of God, Jesus' people. Jesus doesn't fit in the world. He's an outsider, not just because he's from heaven, but because he's obedient to God. He's opposed to evil, and the world is run by the evil one. And so Jesus says, you're not of the world. I chose you out of the world. You used to be of the world, but you're not of the world anymore. And, and don't be surprised if the world hates you, right? Revulsion. It creates a kind of separation. John says in 1 John 2, don't love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see? There needs to be a kind of separation between the people of God and the people of the world. It's complicated, and we'll get to the complexities. But listen to Jesus. This is Jesus praying in John 17. He says, I have given them, his disciples, your word, 
The world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I don't ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. They're in the world, but they're not to be of the world. There, there needs to be a separation. God's people, Jacob's family, is going to be in Egypt, but they're not to become Egyptians, you see? And one of the safeguards that keeps them from becoming Egyptians is their shepherds. And guess what? The Egyptians hate shepherds. And one of the ways that God keeps the identity of His people and us, you might not like this, He puts us in a world that's hostile to us. And increasingly, the very badge Christian will marginalize us and Cause us to be shunned and put aside and separated. And you know what? It's not such a bad thing. It's not such a bad thing. It helps us keep our identity and not get swallowed up by the world. Secondly, uncommon wisdom. There's blessing. And I'm going to focus on the first two and we'll blaze through the last two. But there's a, there's a blessing. So in verse 7 to 10 of Genesis 47... It says this, Joseph brought in Jacob his father and stood him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Jacob, how many are the days of your life? Now, okay, there's a couple ways you could read this. Okay, Jacob coming into Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, maybe he says, how many are the days of your life? Maybe he looks at Jacob and says, how many are the days of your life? <laughs> right? How old are you? Because Jacob says, the days of my sojourning are 130 years, right? You'd ask that too if you saw a guy 130 years old. How old are you? Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. They've not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. Sounds kind of bitter, doesn't he? Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. And Joseph settled his father and his brothers in the land and gave them possession in the land of Egypt and the best of the land, in the land of Ramses, as Pharaoh had commanded. You can almost picture that (laughs) that meeting between Jacob, the old shepherd, and, and Pharaoh. One reason the Egyptians may have hated shepherds, there's number of reasons why I didn't talk to you about that but one of them might be you remember watching the old Charlton Heston movie was at the Exodus and Yul Brynner is Pharaoh and, and he's always perfectly cleanly shaven in fact if you look at if, if you picture in your mind the ancient Egyptians you're or, or maybe you're thinking the mummy movie because that's that's how you young people get into Egyptian cultures the mummy movie very clean, very clean people, very clean shaven. They were meticulously clean. Shepherds, they're fresh off the farm, right? And so the Egyptians like to be clean. Shepherds, they were never clean. And that could be one reason the Egyptians really hated shepherds. And so when, when you picture this meeting between Jacob and Pharaoh, you're picturing this grizzled old shepherd who still smells like a old guy who just traveled from Canaan to Egypt, which is not very good, I would imagine, and Pharaoh, who's meticulously groomed. You remember, don't you, when Joseph was about to go meet Pharaoh, he had to shave and put on new clothes before he met Pharaoh? He'd like guys to be clean, but this is probably not the case here. And Jacob meets with Joseph. And Jacob does something remarkable. He blesses Pharaoh. Now you remember that God said, Abraham, you and your offspring are going to bless, the, you're going to be a blessing to the nations. You're going to bless all kinds of people. And that's going on here. God is blessing Egypt through Jacob. But there's something else going on here too. I love this. When you, when you think about this, Hebrews 7, 7 simply says, it is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. So, so picture Pharaoh, the great king, the most powerful man in the ancient Near East, and Jacob, the grizzled old shepherd, 130 years old, and a little bit ticked off about how his life went. And who's the greater man? Well, by all appearances, it's Pharaoh. 
Who gives the blessing? Jacob does. Jacob does. Jacob is God's man. This is, this is a meeting of the two greatest men on earth. And Jacob is the greater of the two. And so Jacob blesses Pharaoh. What on earth is Jacob doing? I wonder if, if Jacob doesn't have ringing in his ears the words that God said to Abraham, know for certain, this is Genesis 15, 13, know for certain that your offspring are going to be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. It's very possible that Jacob knew that this is what was going on. We're down in Egypt and we're going to be here for a while and it's not going to go well for us. Because God said, you're going to go to a land that's not yours, you're going to become slaves there, you're going to be afflicted for 400 years. And Jacob may know that. I'm sure he did. And it may be in his mind. And he blessed Pharaoh anyway. Isn't that weird? There are two things that are often true in the ages. God's people have faced grave opposition and hostility. This happens in all times and in all places. And number two, God's people are consistently a blessing, even to those who mistreat them. In Jeremiah 29, God's people have been taken out of Israel and into Babylon. They've been... They're being bought and sold as slaves. They're, they're under total domination by the Babylonians. Their life is rough. It's really rough. And, and, and they cry out to God, like, what on earth are we going to do here? And, and Jeremiah, the prophet, comes to them and says, okay, here's what God says you should do. You're in Babylon. Life is rough. You're not at your home. Here's what you do. 29.5, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, eat their produce, take wives, have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons, give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there, do not decrease, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. What's that? Babylon. The Babylonians were not nice people. They were savage. And these exiles had no doubt had relatives and friends who were mercilessly slaughtered by the Babylonians in days gone by. And what does God say? Seek the welfare of that city. You bless those people. You bless those people. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. Now there's no real future for the Jews in Babylon. It's an oppressive people. They're not of that culture it's totally counterintuitive to, to, to bless these people and to seek their welfare. We grew up, didn't we, with the old song, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And, and kind of the idea was, you know, just don't take it too seriously. We don't live here, that's fine. We're, we're getting out of here. And, and there's truth to that. But we're still guests, aren't we? Maybe, maybe we're not of the world. Maybe this world isn't our home. But we're guests here. We're living here. And we want to bless this place. Look, you can read through Second Peter. Here, here's, let me give you a, a brief synopsis of the future of this world. God burns it all up with fire. <laughs> okay? Your boat, your car, your house, this building, it's all going. When Jesus comes, it's all burning to the ground. None of this is going to last. So what do we do? Bless this place, right? Bless this world. Be a blessing. Uh, do good. Be a good guest. It's, it's an uncommon wisdom to bless the world we don't belong to, to, to bless a world that's hostile to us, to bless a world that is opposed to Christ, to bless a world from which, in some sense, we're separated from. We get that. But God is at work in us, and and we can bless it. I love that. We can bless the world. It is beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. And here we are, in Christ, in a superior position to bless the world. This world doesn't deserve to be blessed. 
But we can do it anyway, and we would be wise to do so. All right, let me just give you number three and number four. Number three, uncommon wisdom, is servitude. Servitude. (laughs) This is really challenging. Because here's what Joseph does. Famine has come, and so people can't grow any crops. Joseph has the huge reserve, so he starts selling them, right? He starts selling them, and people run out of money. And there's still a lot of famine left. And they're like, we're out of grain, and we're out of money. All we got left is, will you take our cows? Okay, yeah, I'll trade you livestock. So, so Joseph trades livestock for, for grain, and he gives them grain. And after a little bit, the famine is still going, and they're like, we got no cow. The only thing we got left is our property and ourselves. Will you take that? And Joseph's like, okay, yeah, I'll take that. And he does. And, and he ends up nationalizing the, the property of Egypt. And he has a legal claim over all the citizens and all the inhabitants. And it sounds like he enslaves the whole population. And you think, well, I'm not sure I like the sound of that. Oh, I want to say a lot about that, but I'm out of time already. Wait, no, yes. Darn. <laughs> Here's what we can say about that. In verse 25, the, the people say, you have saved our lives. They're grateful. They're thankful for what Joseph has done. Here's, here's the challenge Joseph faces, Okay. You, you need to think about this. I've been thinking about this for three months trying to figure this out. So I'm going to put this in your head and you figure it out. You remember when, when they had the good years and they knew the famine was coming and so Joseph kept back part of the harvest. You remember what that percentage was? 20%. It's like 20% of the crop, we're storing it. All right, so, so I did the math. 20% every year, 20% times 7 makes 1.4 years worth of Harvest, right? All, all cumulative total. Okay? Now, I don't think that the Egyptians survived on 20% of their crop every year. I don't think they had 80% that they were exporting. It doesn't seem rational. So Joseph has a lot of grain, but he still has to stretch it out for seven years. How do you do that? How do you get people to eat less? Because you've got to feed them for seven years and you've only kept back 20%. You know, it seems like just cut it in half. Half for the bad year, half for the good year. But he doesn't. It's an 80-20 split. How does he do that? That's tricky. And guess what? Here's, here's part of human nature. When there's a scarcity coming and people know there's a scarcity, you know what they do? They hoard it. You remember the great toilet paper crisis of three, four years ago? Somebody on Facebook somewhere said it's hard to get toilet paper. And the whole world went and bought it all. Or not the whole world, like seven guys. They put it in their garage, you know, (laughs) sold it on eBay. It's like, oh, this is frustrating. What do you think happens when when word gets out, there's going to be seven years of famine. And there's going to be no grain. How do you think that works? Okay, How do you keep people from hoarding? How do you stretch that out? That takes some wisdom. That takes some wisdom. And, and so I think Joseph is acting with incredible wisdom to lead his nation through this. And at the end of the day, though they're, though they're servants, he's created a strong nation that is going to protect the people and, and be good for them. Servitude makes us a little bit squeamish. But in the New Testament, you know, servitude is, is the path of greatness. It's the path of greatness. For Paul, one of his favorite self-designations is, I'm the slave of Jesus Christ. That's not such a bad thing. If, if, if you're going through a bad time, the, the thing you'd want to do is, is be connected to somebody who can care for you. And you know what? God will do this. God will sometimes allow us to become so desperate he will take away everything in our life and allow us to become so desperate that the only place we have to turn is to him and the only thing we have to give is ourselves and you know what that's not a bad place to be is it it's painful to get there 
But there's an uncommon wisdom in servitude, in serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally is faith. Faith, there's a great act of faith on Jacob's part. In verse 27, Israel settles in the land of Egypt and the land of Goshen. They gained possessions in it. They were fruitful and multiplied greatly. God's promises are coming true to Abraham and his family, even though they're in Egypt. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the days of Jacob, the years of his life, were 147 years. And when the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph and said to him, If now I found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh. Remember the old hand under the thigh oath. It's unforgettable. Promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt. Bury me in their burying place. He said, I'll do as you've said. He said, swear to me. He said, feel the intensity here. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the bed. Jacob knowing perhaps that his family will be in Egypt for generations, knows we're going back. That's the land that God gave us, and we're going back there. And he insists that when he dies, they carry him back there. Now, common sense says, (laughs) common sense when it comes to burial says, cheap, okay? (laughs) Um, And it's expensive to run him way back up there. It takes a lot of time and energy. And who cares anyway? God can find you wherever you are, Jacob. Why is this such a big deal for you? But it was a big deal for him. There, there's a powerful symbolism there. <laughs> Jacob could have said, man, we're in Egypt. This burial thing is pretty good down here. Maybe I get me a pyramid and become a mummy and, you know, that whole thing. They knew how to bury people. And Jacob's like, you know, just get me back to the cave. Grandpa's there. Dad's there. My wife is there. That's where I want to go. And, and he is signaling to his family, this is a great act of faith. He is signaling to his family God's promises are going to come true. It's going to be after I'm gone. I, I, I'm not going to make those promises come true. God's going to have to do that. But he's signaling to his family. You can trust God. His promises are going to come true. And he, he does that through his, through his burial. All right. Uncommon wisdom. The uncommon wisdom of uh, separation. Uh, I forgot my own outline already. <laughs> Number, uh, what do we got? Um, oh yeah, blessing. Yeah, separation, blessing, servitude, and faith. All right, Heavenly Father, help us to trust Your Word, which is so full of this uncommon wisdom. Lord, we're thankful for common sense, and and You've You've given that to us, and it's a wonderful gift, and it, it leads us through life in a, in a delightful way. But your word gives us uncommon wisdom, these counterintuitive things that please you, that bless us, bless others. So, Lord, make us people, not just of common sense, but of uncommon wisdom. Pray that you would bless our fathers in particular this morning as they lead their families in difficult days in challenging days, in, in days of, we might say, a moral famine, in days when uh, there are so many forces arrayed to snatch up our children and destroy them, arm our fathers with uncommon wisdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.